Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our second Medical Humanities webinar. This session follows our inaugural session on inequalities of health. And today we will discuss food and medicine. The biomedical connection between the food that we eat and the health, or our health, is without question. Singapore has joined affluent societies um, in which chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia have become more prevalent and are now major causes of mortality and morbidity. And with each of these questions, diet plays not only a big part in causation, but also in treatment. And on the other end of the spectrum, um, the lack of food or insufficiency of food can also cause a number of challenges with your health. What then is the connection between culture, society, medicine, and the food that we eat? Take food preparation, for example. What defines what is properly or improperly prepared is a question of culture and not science. Equally, the consumption of the food, who consumes it, who we consume it with, and in what settings we consume food are all cultural notions. And because of the biomedical connection between food and health, these cultural influences impact our health, both individually and that of the population, which is why in medical humanities, we're trying to bridge this gap between the science and the humanities. Uh, and, in, and for that reason, we are looking at food today. And on top of that, in Singapore, we are, of course, a culture that proudly defines itself by the food that we eat. Um, and we are very, very proud of this, obviously. We have a terrific panel today uh, of two individuals that I admire tremendously. And we're going to cover everything from the spectrum of living to eat and eating to live. Dr. Leslie Tay is a physician, author, blogger, photographer, speaker. He sounds like the consummate Renaissance man. And Ms. Nicole Ng is the co-founder of the Food Bank and the CEO of X Inc. Group of Companies. So really excellent speakers. When we listen to them today, I hope that um, the audience will reflect on the medical humanities component. I hope we can reflect on our cultural identity, how our cultural identity is created through the food that we eat and the meals that we have how meals appeal to satisfaction of hunger, of notions of pleasure, and more broadly of who we are as a people, how meals are situational and context-filled, and what we eat and whom we eat with and when we eat defines us in so many, many ways. I also hope that we can learn a little bit about giving to help others who are insecure about their food who don't have these opportunities and that in itself, that giving in itself will also define us. So I would encourage the audience to ask questions through the chat function. Just type out your questions and um, I will put them to our panelists. What we will do is we will have both presentations first before we have the panel discussion. So without much ado, let us have our speakers. It gives me great pleasure to first introduce Dr. Leslie Tay. Dr. Leslie Tay has spent more than a decade searching for the best food of Singapore. I feel like I've spent more than four decades doing it, but he spent a decade. His epic food adventures are documented in his award-winning food blog, I Eat, I Shoot, I Post .sg, as well as Facebook and Instagram. He's now regarded as one of the authorities on Singapore food, and I believe it, and has appeared on numerous publications and TV programs he has published three books on Singapore food and has delivered talks on Singapore's hawker cuisine to international as well as local audiences. Dr. Tay is a family physician. He practices at Carey Family Clinic in Tampines. He's happily married with two teenagers who often accompany him on food expeditions, but they can get a little impatient when they have to wait while he takes photographs uh, and they have to stop eating like all teenagers. And I've also met his wonderful wife who is who, back, who, who serves as a backup uh, IT tech. Today, we'll be, he'll be talking to us about hawker, about food culture, and I do hope that he will find the time to discuss our favorites at the Hawker Center. Singaporeans are spoiled for choice when it comes to food, and the heart of Singapore food culture lies in our hawker centers. How did these hawker centers arise? 
one of the stories behind some of our most famous dishes. Dr. Tay will take us on a historical journey of the most iconic dishes and discuss some of the implications for public health. Dr. Tay, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. And thanks for uh, inviting me to this uh, webinar. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not used to talking to a screen. I usually, uh, you know, when I deliver this talk, I usually have all the audience because whenever I show these uh, pictures of the food, they usually the oohs and ahs, you know, it, it's sort of like, you know, I can hear all the stomachs growling as well. <laughs> so it's a little bit funny to talk to a screen, uh, but I'm sure uh, you're having a good afternoon. Uh, as we Teochew like to say, it means, have you had lunch? I'm sure you all had, and uh, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. So after lunch, I'm sure all of you are feeling a little bit, you know, sleepy. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a, uh, not the best time to be delivering a talk, but uh, thank you very much for keeping awake and, uh, and to, um, to listen in on this talk. I'm going to be talking about Singapore's hawker heritage and its impact on public health. Uh, the impact on public health part is going to be, I think, the smaller part. The, um, the Singapore hawker heritage uh, part would be the majority of uh, my talk. <clears throat> so, first question, what are the top 10 Singapore hawker dishes? I'm not sure whether the, uh, the participants in this webinar... Sorry? Uh, I'm not sure whether the uh, participants in this uh, webinar can participate but if there's any way for you all to uh, maybe have a think about your top three dishes like if you're talking about Singapore hawker food right what are the three most important dishes to you uh, as in if you had spent a month in Switzerland or France or Italy or the US and you come back to Singapore what are the first three dishes that you will go out and try to find okay think about it and if you can Put, put something in your chat or however we do it. Uh, yes, Cindy Go has got chicken rice. Okay, is, is that all? I'm sure there are many of you down there. We can just share maybe even just the top one dish that you are going to uh, be looking for. The first thing you come back to Singapore, oh, Hokkien Mee, I see Hokkien Mee, good. Hainanese chicken rice, Hokkien Mee, Rojak, Bacchor Mee, good. Laksa, wow, Prata, Bakute. You're making us <coughs> hungry. Oyster, omelette, mipo. Oh, laksa, yes. I see chicken rice, ho fun, clay pot rice, uh, char kway tiao, Kaylin. Kaylin likes char kway tiao. Mona likes char kway tiao. Good. Uh, Selena likes chicken rice, mipo, coconut. What? Coconut? Just coconut, no uh, Agnes, we got misiam. Oh, misiam is uh, one of those. Uh, Less, less popular, but still very much a uh, part of Singapore food. Carrot cake. I got mee robos. Satay. Yes, that's one of my favorites. Carrot cake. I'm sure you all can see everybody else's response also, right? Chili crab. We're all, all running in. You see how much our food, you know, motivates us when we talk about food. If you are, you know, you know a Singaporean overseas, when you start talking, you know, you, you meet up, uh, when you're overseas and i lived in overseas for about 10 years uh almost 10 years and uh, every time you meet another singaporean invariably you talk about food so our food are very much a part of uh of our culture so <clears throat> no okay here we go so as you can see uh very much in line with what everybody has chosen uh, this is a poll that I did about a few years back, polling all our readers. So you got chicken rice, Hokkien Mee, number two. Most popular is chicken rice. I think you know why. Because chicken rice, uh, young, old, uh, all the races, you know, chicken is a very universal kind of meat. So all the races can eat it. All religions can eat it. Young can eat it. Old can eat it. It's not spicy. It's not very threatening. It is a very... Uh, simple, straightforward, yet yummy dish, which is why it's uh, number one. <clears throat> then you got Hokkien Mee, you got Cha Kway Tiao, Carrot King, all the fried stuff, right? And this uh, the implication on <laughs> public health later on when we talk about uh, all the carbs, all the laksa, bak chor mee, wonton mee, prawn mee, oyster omelette, and roti prata. So that sort of uh, 
really just a, a good summary of all the um, all the important dishes in our lives. Chakwetiao. I wrote a book called The End of Chakwetiao about 10 years ago, 2010. I published it. Uh, my editor, when he wanted to publish my book, my book is all about Singapore hawker food. Nah. So you look at a plate of chakwetiao like this. Doesn't it make your mouth water? It's a, represent, it's a representative of Singapore food and it also represents uh, why I say the end of chakwetiao. It represents the end of an era. When we, talk, when we talk about hawker food, we really are looking at the end of one era because a lot of the hawkers are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and a lot of them are retiring. The first generation of hawkers who have provided for us all this wonderful food, a lot of them are dying. I'm not dying, sorry. Retiring. <laughs> retiring. Some of them, I'm sure, have really passed on. But uh, they are the generation of Singaporeans who built the country and who... Uh, basically provided the sustenance for, for all the people, from ministers to, uh, to the ordinary folk on the ground. Uh, everybody uh, grew up on hawker food. But when you look at a chakwetiao like this, right, you, you, you begin to realize why is it, why I say it's the end of chakwetiao. Because basically the number of chakwetiao hawkers nowadays, you can, uh, if you want to count the really good ones, they are worth your calories, right? The, the really good ones, that you don't mind eating, putting on the calories and the saturated fats and the carbs, and uh, you don't mind eating it because it is good, it is delicious. To find a plate of chakwetiao like this nowadays, not easy. There are probably, probably about 10 very famous stalls they can go for, uh, for a plate of chakwetiao. And if you, uh, my, my, my motto is always uh, never waste your calories on yucky food. So, uh, my advice to all my patients as well as, well as my friends, uh, if you want to eat chakwetiao, you know it's not uh, very healthy for you. It's uh, full of lard, it's full of carbs, it's a very simple thing, it's, it's eggs and it's, uh, it's got cockles as well that can give you hepatitis A. You know, it's not exactly the, the Mediterranean diet, you know, this is the kind of diet that Singaporeans uh, live on, uh, you know, in our pioneering days. This is the kind of hawker, coolie, blue collar, worker food that we all grew up with and we all grew up liking. So if you want to eat something like this, yummy, really just uh, full of carbs that will fill your tummy, uh, really full of umami that will satisfy your taste buds, then uh, you make sure you find yourself a good plate. Now, if you don't know where to find it, you can go to my blog, eatishuapost.sg, and then you uh, go and find yourself a good plate of chakwiti and never waste your calories on a plate of chakwetia that only fills your tummy but doesn't satisfy your taste buds. So you see, this plate of chakwetia, eat until all almost finish. The, all the pork lard left behind. Try not to eat, la. I mean, you know, pork lard are good on one hand, yummy on one hand. Uh, the British uh, come out with papers saying that now uh, this is one of the top 10 most nutritious food, but uh, it's still high in saturated fat. So it'll increase your cholesterol levels. Uh, cockles, as I foresaid, uh, uh, risk of hepatitis A, although with the Singapore uh, Food Agency nowadays, <clears throat> not, not nowadays, but it's always been our government authorities make it make sure that we don't get uh, hepatitis uh, from eating all this food. But, you know, because of all these issues, that's why, again, Chakwetiao is dying because, you know, your doctor tell you don't eat, but then this puddy tell you go and eat, your friend say, hey, this Chakwetiao very nice, but then you're, you're, you know your cholesterol level is high. So, and then, or, or either that, or you're putting on too much weight, so you cannot take too much carb, cannot take too much oily food. Chakwetiao is, uh, that's why I call it the end of chakwetiao, because it's got bad rap. Uh, not many people want to fry it anymore. And so, the, in the last 10 years since I wrote the book, The End of Chakwetiao, unfortunately, there hasn't been a new upcoming young chakwetiao hawker. And that is a fact. If they are there, I would have found them. Because every time I hear of young people going out to fry chakwetiao, I'll go and look for them. I'll try and then try to encourage them. Because uh, if you are a young hawker frying chakwetiao, you are rarer than a panda. Rarer than a panda. You know, you only, you know, a handful, maybe one or two in the whole world, okay, who can fry this dish properly. Okay, let's move on from chakwetiao. Let's talk about where our ancestors, forefathers come from. So as you know, we have an indigenous Malay population 
And then, you know, in the 1800s or so, all the Chinese came from uh, southern part of China and they uh, came across Nanyang, right? We've got the Hokkien's, the biggest population. Uh, and then uh, the Teochew, the second biggest population. They are all coastal towns in the southern part of China. Uh, and then, of course, the Cantonese uh, came and the Hainanese. So these are the main big four population. And these are the people that are responsible for night, over 90% of our uh, Chinese style hawker food. And of course, we have uh, oh, the Hakka as well. Don't forget Hakka. Hakka is very important because our first family uh, our background is Hakka. And then, of course, we have the Indians coming from the southern part of India, from Chennai, from Kerala. Uh, and they came across because of the British, uh, British brought them over as workers. And so these are the people together with our Malay, uh, local Malay population, they form the, the, the majority of the people in Singapore. And of course, the food and all the food cultures that they bring from their homeland into our little island uh, get meld together into what it is today, right? Grandfather used to tell me, you know, my father used to tell me, my grandfather came from China with nothing more than a small sack and an extra set of clothes. And that is really true. Last year, I went back to my village in uh, Teochew and I found my grandfather's village. And really, you know, China was so poor in the early, late 1800s or early 19th, uh, 20th century. Uh, all these people really just came with nothing just to find a living in Singapore. And, you know, Immigrants, when they come to a new country, uh, the, the two jobs, if you can't find a job as a coolie uh, or you're out of work, what do you do? You, uh, you go and sell food. You see on the right-hand side, we can't, we can't, up, we can't, we can't, can we, up, can we highlight it? You can point the people. Yeah. Can see. Oh, can you see? Okay. Yeah, see. So, so, so this guy here, this guy here is selling food lah. Right, so if you you don't know what to do with you know you're in a foreign country, you don't know what to do. You sell food, or you go and drive Grab lah. So this is uh this is the <laughs> Grab driver of the of the past. This is a rickshaw rickshaw puller. So society has always been like that. These are the two kinds of work that uh, people gravitate to. You know, especially now also COVID nineteen situation, you see a lot of people actually uh, going into uh, hawker because it is, it is easy to do. It is something that has got very low barriers to entry. You go and get a NEA hawker stall for a few hundred or a few thousand dollars uh, just to rent the stall. Then you, you sell something that you're passionate about. And that's how hawkers, our hawkers in the past uh, came about uh, as well. That's how our hawker culture is born. And so, so this uh, Hokkien Mee is one of the most famous and one of the most uh, yummy uh, things that we have on our little red dot. I don't know whether you realize this, but Hokkien Mee has a very special place uh, in, in the, even in the canon of uh, Singapore hawker dishes. Uh, Hokkien Mee is special because when you talk about chicken rice, the Malaysians, they will say, ah, oh, they have chicken rice as well. The Thais will say they have chicken rice as well. You know, even Chakwe Tiao, Penang always say they have their own Chakwe Tiao. You know, Laksa, they all have also. But when it comes to Hokkien fried mee, this uh, plate of noodles is, uh, Singapore is only the, the only real place in the world that this uh, plate of noodles uh, you can find in such quantity and such quality and such uh, flavor. <clears throat> now, how did it come about? It's actually a real Singapore uh, dish. This man, uh, Mr. Ng, Mr. Ng is, uh, he's from Nam Singh, Hokkien Mee at Old Airport Road. His father, together with his uncle, the two of them started frying Hokkien Mee um, in the, in the uh, 50s. And they were coolies, they were Hokkien coolies. And after, after a long day's work, they would just throw something together, put a wok, <coughs> build a charcoal fire on the ground with a few bricks, throw a wok on the ground, and then they start frying this noodle, just throw everything inside, you know. Uh, near the uh, new seven-story hotel area in Rocho, which is why at first it was called Rocho Mi. Some people even call it uh, just ground. Uh, in Hokkien, they call it Toka Mi because it was fried on the floor. And uh, they became famous. And so all this, uh, these two men went off and opened a little stall selling Hokkien fried noodles. And uh, Mr. Ng has been, has been uh, frying these noodles now for 54 years. Uh, and 54 years of frying just the one dish, 
having one stall, trying one dish for such a long period of time. And that is what makes Singapore hawker food so unique. You know, in, in overseas countries, uh, if you're in the European countries, whatever, uh, you don't find people just specializing in one dish, just one dish for a whole lifetime. Uh, and so he has 54 years to perfect his frying skill for this just one dish, <clears throat> which is what makes um, Singapore, you know, hawker culture so important to us because this is what defines who we are. So the good news with uh, Hokkien Mee, as opposed to Chak Kui Tiao, is uh, with Hokkien Mee, there seems to be uh, new hawkers entering into the, into the uh, uh, hawker trade. This, uh, this gentleman here, he runs a Hokkien Mee stall in Lorong 7, Topayo, called um, Hokkien Man, Hokkien Mee, because he is Hokkien. So he used to be a fine dining chef at Les Amis. And uh, he ditched the uh, fine dining chef's apron to don on uh, a hawker's apron. And he started to produce this plate of Hokkien Mee using Western <coughs> skills of making stock, you know, and having uh, his ideas of what makes the Hokkien Mee, uh, uh, you know, how to perfect this, this very traditional dish. So when it comes to Hokkien Mee, I think there is uh, a future for Hokkien Mee. Uh, but unfortunately for our poor Cha Kui Tiao, it's, uh, it's still looking very bleak. So some dishes are doing well and some dishes are not uh, doing so well. So as you all know, this hawker culture of ours is so important. Our government has uh, put it up for the UNESCO list of intangible heritage. Uh, and it looks like the latest, um, the latest news is that, uh, the latest news is that uh, we, are, we are almost gonna get it because the expert panel has already recommended it to UNESCO to be put into the UNESCO list of um, intangible heritage. So, so, so it looks like we are going to get it very soon. Uh, and there will be good news for all our hawkers who have worked so hard uh, to, to really build this hawker culture and giving us Singaporeans this particular thing that we, we all know, you know, when it comes to culture, we all know what it is, but it's sometimes very difficult to put your finger on what it really is. But the hawker culture, what it really is, is being able to go to this place called a hawker center, coffee shop, whatever, and then knowing that you're going to find a lot of stalls selling lots of food at a very cheap price and knowing that uh, you will have uh, tables that are fixed there with chairs that are fixed and knowing how to chop your seat. Uh, you know that uh, you, you know that when you go to a hawker center, first thing is to find a table, chop your seat, and then everybody go and line up for their food. And then you know how to spot the good hawker store from the uh, from not so good hawker store, look for the queues look for the, you know, all the accolades, you know, the, all the channel five, channel eight, I eat, I should have post recommended food stalls and then sit down. Uh, and then nowadays, the, the hawker culture is now changing where everybody thinks, oh, okay, now, now need, nowadays need to return our trays, make sure that, uh, make sure that we try to keep the table clean. We're trying to promote this culture now. And of course, then the auntie will come and clean your table. And, uh, and then people will come and sell you uh, clinics and then for $2, $1. This is all part of our hawker culture, which is what makes Singapore hawker culture uh, unique. I know a lot of countries around in, in Thailand, in Malaysia, also have their hawker street culture. But our, our, our culture here is very, very unique, which is why we are trying to preserve it. So how the question is how to preserve hawker culture, because all these older hawkers are retiring and there's no one... Uh, and not enough are uh, actually replacing them. So <clears throat> I sit on the Hawker 3.0 committee and we looked at this problem. Now, if we want to preserve our Hawker culture for the future generation, how are we going to do it when there are not enough people coming into the trade? So these are the, big, the, the questions that we need to work on, you know, to, in order to uh, ensure that 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, which is irrelevant to me, I, I think, <laughs> it would, but relevant to a lot of young Singaporeans is whether or not we still have a hawker culture, whether we still have a hawker center that we can go to to enjoy our food. So 
government is now looking at new schemes to help retiring hawkers pass on stalls and skills to safeguard hawker culture. This has only been released. This is what we've been working on. Uh, we are trying to see how we can help the retiring hawkers have a small little pension as they train the next generation. That means the government uh, is going to play matchmaker. Lah. We are going to try to match make young aspiring hawkers or people who are looking to go into the hawker trade. We're going to try to marry them with a with an old hawker who uh, who has no one to pass the uh, business to. Try to marry the two of them together and see how whether we can continue uh, the tradition. Okay, but on the other hand, <clears throat> now that's the other problem. The other problem we have is uh, you know uh, three years ago we heard Singapore's PM declaring war on diabetes in a national day message. And diabetes is a big problem in Singapore. Uh, in 2014, 440,000 Singaporeans have diabetes and it's estimated to go up to 1 million by 2050. And that has very, very big implications on uh, our public health. And uh, being a family doctor, I can certainly tell you that uh, we see a lot of uh, cases of diabetes as well as high blood pressure and cholesterol. But Diabetes is a big problem, but why is it such a big problem in Singapore? Well, because um, because of the food that we uh, we eat, really. I mean, if you think about it, we are not uh, Mediterranean. We are not Greece and Italy, where they eat a lot of olive oil, nuts, fish. Uh, we don't have a Mediterranean diet. We have a very blue collar coolie diet, which is full of carbs, which is full of oil which is full of soy sauce, salt, and things to make it cheap ways of making things, cheap ways of che uh, making cheap things yummy, uh, to fill your tummy. That's, that's our hawker culture. That's how we, we all have evolved because we are not, we did not develop from a, a rich uh, background. We developed from a very poor uh, sort of a background. All our ancestors, when they came to this country, they were poor. And so <clears throat> our country is built out of necessity. And that's why we have things like kway teow, noodles, rice, lots of uh, dishes, our uh, hawker dishes, full of all these uh, high carbohydrates, high oil, soy sauce, uh, salt, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of food, right? Because that's, that's how we grew out of. And so now the, the challenge is for the health um, promotion board, we are doing a great job trying to help promote um, uh, healthier eating. <clears throat> eating light at a hawker center is possible, but as you and I know, we, we like to talk about eating light, but uh, when it comes to actually choosing the food we eat, uh, people still go for taste. Uh. One third of Singaporeans eat out more than seven times a week. 80% of Singaporeans eat out at hawker centers more than once a week. Uh, preliminary analysis also showed that people who usually eat out at food centers consume 200 kilo calories more uh, or about 10% more than those who seldom eat out. There's no question about it. When you eat out at the hawker center, you, you're, if you eat out a lot at a hawker center, you're not going to get enough vegetables. You're not going to get uh, your uh, high fiber, low carb diet. Okay. So because hawker food by nature is not designed for for that purpose. You see, this is from the American Dietetic Association. Cultural food practices of Singapore. And when you read this, uh, all of them you'll be nodding, nodding. Yes, yes, yes. Singaporeans usually eat three meals, three main meals a day. So this is reported by an overseas person trying to categorize what Singaporeans are like when they eat, right? And occasionally a late night supper. Yes, everybody nodding. Hey, uh, popular breakfast is toast with kaya, mm, a sweet coconut egg jam, soft boiled eggs, yum and coffee with condensed milk. Another breakfast dish is roti prata. Everybody licking their lips. And an Indian fluffy pancake, rich in fat. You see the way they write it also, they, they are trying to demonize it really, right? Uh, eaten with curry. Lunch and dinner are similar, usually consisting of rice or noodles accompanied by stir-fried meat vegetables. Many Singaporeans have their meals at hawker centers, which are collections of stalls selling simple local economic food. Supper is eaten around midnight and is a popular affair in Singapore, especially on weekends. People flock to late night eateries selling a variety of foods ranging from curries to stir fried noodles to hot sweet dessert soup. Yes, everybody. Yes, that's who we are. This We are Singaporeans. This is how we eat. <laughs> so very challenging, right? So how, 
uh, on one hand, we have a hawker culture that defines who we are. Uh, and uh, it's something that we are all proud of, something that we all grew up with, something that we all know, something that we all crave for. Uh, on the other hand, we have this problem uh, because this is our lifestyle and the kind of food that we eat, uh, you know, it's not very, very conducive for public health. So this is the challenge that we're facing uh, at the moment. So I'm going to, uh, in conclusion, right, just a few more slides on uh, a bit more on hawker culture. Lah, right? This is, of course, our kopi and kaya toast. And kopi and kaya toast, we have to talk about the Hainanese. The Hainanese people came from Hainan a little bit late. They came later than the Cantonese, Teochews, and Hokkien. So by the time they came here, all the good jobs have already been taken. All the all the jobs that require you know less less backbreaking work, the Teochews and the Hokkiens, they're all into the trade already, the warehousing and all these things. Uh, the trading is already gone to all these uh, groups. And in those days, uh, if you are if you are you're categorized by your dialect group, right? So so if you are Hainanese. When you arrive in this country, you seek out the Hainanese, your Hainanese uh, folks, you know, all your, all your, all your comrades, all your Hainanese comrades, and then, and then within that association, you find find your work. So the poor Hainanese, when they came into our, our country, they were a bit late. Every all the good jobs have been taken, so a lot of them went into food, into food, okay, and a lot of them uh, became sailors and they worked for the British, and from the British, they learned how to make coffee. And of course, they learn how to make toast. And uh, because in those days, you can't get hold of jam. So they, they were the ones who came up with this idea of uh, making a coconut-based jam with uh, eggs, giving us uh, kaya. So we have the Hainanese to thank for our favorite uh, classic Singapore breakfast of kopi and kaya toast. And we have the Hainanese to thank also for, this is curry rice, right? Uh, curry rice born out of... Uh, the result of the Hainanese cooks cooking, um, they were working for the Nonia uh, and they were working for the British. So from the British, they, they learned how to make pork chops. From the Nonia, they learned how to make curry and chap chai and all the braised pork. And we have uh, the, the beautiful mess, which is Hainanese curry rice, which we all enjoy. And of course, number one, chicken rice. Chicken rice uh, born, uh, out of the Hainanese, uh, Wen Chang Chi from Hainan. It was in the 50s that uh, this dish got popular. It got popular because of a, a man called Mo Li Tui. Uh, Mo Li Tui in the Hainanese uh, founded the very famous or legendary um, Suiki chicken rice. Uh, I think only, only the older folks among us will remember Suiki because Suiki was very popular in the 50s all the way until they closed in a in the 90s. And in those days, the, when you talk about chicken rice uh, and where's the best chicken rice in Singapore, the, it is undisputed. It is undisputed that Suiki has the very best chicken rice. And because of Suiki, chicken rice became popular in Singapore. And because of Suiki, and because it's popular in Singapore, uh, and this is a bit controversial, and because it's popular in Singapore, uh, the countries around us start to copy. Right, and uh, but it was us. We invented chicken rice. We popularized it. The way of eating chicken rice, it is a Singaporean dish, and it deserves its place as number one. So, with that, I'm going to end the talk and thank everyone for your attention this afternoon. Thank you, Leslie, for that mouth-watering talk. I guess the real question is, how do you manage to keep in shape when you're surrounded by all that good food? Yeah, yeah only eat the good ones. Uh, no good one, you fast. <laughs> Sounds like a, it requires quite a bit of discipline. Um, shall, shall we change track now to, uh, to Nicole um, from talking about delicious uh, hawker food? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about food insecurity. Um, food insecurity is about having an uh, inability to access sufficient, well-balanced food due to either physical or financial uh, shortcomings. Um, and by identifying specific factors that contribute to food insecurity and learning about experiences of people that people have, we may be able to bridge the gap to fill a smoother, more targeted support distribution system so that everyone has enough food. 
Ms. Nicole Ng co-founded in 2012 the Food Bank Singapore, which aims to end food insecurity in Singapore. The Food Bank Singapore collects and redistributes excess food to about 360 non-profit organizations, reaching out to more than 300,000 underprivileged. That's amazing. Um, Nicole is also the CEO of the X Group of Companies. In a talk, she's going to talk in depth about food insecurity, where it all began uh, for the food bank, and how to move forward. How does our society get re rid of food insecurity, which will lead us to social stability? Nicole? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, after the very yummy presentation, <laughs> I will try to uh, match up to what Dr. Tay has already presented. Um, but I thought I would like to start my conversation today by sharing with you that um, food has a very, very important place in my heart um, for a few reasons. So firstly, uh, my grandfather came from China in the 1930s and we started a small provision shop. Um, and therefore now I, I get to serve 5,000 over F&B establishments. So we've been in food distribution business uh, even way before World War II. So we're kind of with the hawker culture in, uh, in the very early days. I think this is a nice way to, to start that conversation and link back to what uh, Dr. Tay has actually presented. Um, I, I truly believe that um, the way food has been sold and uh, served has actually created a culture that we are in right now, the way that we eat, the way that we dine out, etc. And uh, it has become the lifeline of uh, my family business, uh, having gone through plenty of ups and downs as well, including complete bankruptcy in 97 uh, before I joined uh, university. So we, have, we had at some point um, went through uh, very, very tough times as well uh, together as a family. So having struggled through uh, putting food on the table sometimes, um, we decided that if there was in fact any way that we could revive uh, my grandfather's business, um, my brother and I took it upon ourselves to ensure that we are going to give back to, to society at some point. Yeah, and uh, therefore, uh, shortly after SARS in 2002 3 uh, my, my dad, my late father, actually asked me to come back to the family business after I was working in my first job to say that, hey, can you modernize uh, uh, the food distribution business? Um, I wanted to start there because um, the other reason also is food has a very, very important place in my heart, not because um, I love to bake, I love to cook, I stepped in the kitchen since I was two and a half. Um, but I actually struggled with eating disorder for more than 30 years. And uh, this is uh, some things that some people might know about me and some doesn't know. Uh, and uh, I, I, just, I just realized and I mentioned about this because SGH had a very, very uh, long-standing relationship in, in, in my recovery process. You know, so I was constantly at SGH and all that as well for a couple of years for the support group and all that. But I just wanted to use my eating disorder as a starting point as well. A lot of people feel that food is just to fill the tummies. But like most of us regular folk, we eat to feel good. We, you know, after a long day, you know, I, I want to reach out to a chocolate. I feel like having a cup of hot cocoa or a Milo dinosaur or something like that. Or I have to start my day with a uh, kopi kosong, for example. Um, it just fills a void. It's not just your tummy, right? But it makes you feel good in general. So anyway, uh, on this note, this brings me to uh, my presentation, which I will share and I will go through quickly. So all of you get to ask questions. Um, maybe some of you will be asking, like, you know, uh, why did we even think of starting the food bank in Singapore? Okay, in Singapore, there is no poverty line, there is no minimum wage. Uh, and so therefore, compared to other first world countries, it is very, very difficult for us to define actually who are the people that go hungry on a daily basis. So coming from uh, where, where we are, okay, so firstly, food costs has escalated through the years, that's for sure. Secondly, our incomes have not doubled through the years. Okay, so uh, a humble tin of vegetable oil, for example, which is palm or lean, when I joined the business in 03, um, it was about $11. So in current market rate, it's about $24. So it's more than doubled in under 20 years. So, but definitely all our incomes have not doubled or tripled or something like that, right? So uh, the cost of living has gone up along with the cost of food. Um, secondly, I have to say that uh, I'm very, I feel very lucky sometimes to be a Singaporean because I don't know how many of you know, but um, Singapore is the world's most food secured nation. 
as in if you we are ranked number one globally over the last three years if you if you uh that means we are above norway we're above uk in case you didn't know this means that sfa have done a very good job securing our food sources despite Singapore only growing 10% of everything that we consume. So now you hear about the 30-30 movement, support local farmers, you know, and things like that. Um, but for a tiny little country that imports um, basically nearly everything that we need to consume, not just for our tummies, for our everyday disposables, we're ranked number one as the world's most food secure nation. We're currently importing from more than 100 countries in very safe ways. We have also found a way to import a diverse uh, food source so that like in a pandemic like we are right now, um, none of us are going hungry. So when the borders were closing, there was this whole panic, right? That, oh, there's no more fresh vegetables and things like that. But we're world's most food secure nation. But um, that was... That is on one side. So my question is, if the cost of food in Singapore is relatively low because we have no import taxes, and I think uh, a lot of you would agree, we, you can still get a hot meal for four Singapore dollars. And if any of you have uh, traveled to the US, Australia, UK, or whatever before, you would know that four dollars doesn't get you anything. <laughs> Probably a coffee and half a donut. Um, why is it that cost of food is relatively low? And as food is also very accessible because of the way that we have planned our urban planning. This is very in line with the humanities part of, you know, uh, uh, food structuring or daily necessity structuring, right? In all our HDB flats, you would find a, a doctor, definitely a food court, a supermarket. So all your daily essentials are within your reach. But why is it that you still have so many people that are facing food insecurity? So now, um, in 2012, my brother and I decided to... Uh, set up Singapore's first and only food bank. Uh, so much so that I always share this, um, Singapore is very, very behind in the way that we are redistributing food. Not just It's not just in how we deal with food waste, but also how we uh, are facing poverty issues along with food insecurity. So when we wanted to start food bank in 2012, the first obstacle that I faced was um, the officer on, at, at Accra, right? The, which is because we are we set up as a charity, limited by guarantee, which is a non-profit. But we decided to to start it at Accra, which is a company, uh, the, re the registration um, department, right? For all companies. Um, so the lady said, you know, oh, Singapore got no more banking license. So, and that's when I realized that they thought that we're going to be another DBS or OCBC. Okay, and that's in 2012. Uh, feels like light years away already, eight years ago, nobody quite understand what food banking really is. Okay, so food banking is not new. It's been in the world since 1950s in the US. Uh, it's just that it's not been in Singapore or in Asia in a broad, in a very big way. So um, we bit the bullet as well two years ago because there is no report card for us. We worked so hard through the years trying to salvage food, redistribute food, but Actually, what are the kind of numbers that we're looking at? And when we're talking to expats, locals, combined, like, hey, there's no homeless in Singapore. There's no poor people that lingers around. There's hardly any beggars, right? Like, how come there's food insecurity? And are you sure that there are people going hungry? So we worked with the SMU, uh, Lian Center for Social Innovation. We paid them a quarter million dollars to deep dive into food insecurity. So just now, um, uh, the statement for food insecurity, the definition that we use has already been um, explained during my introduction. Um, it is very important that the definition of food insecurity that we use in Singapore is first world. It, uh, it is in line with what Canada uses, what France uses, is the accessibility to nutritious food to lead a healthy life. Okay, so what are the numbers looking like? Okay, so um, it's 10.4%. This is pre-COVID numbers. I can honestly tell you with COVID, it's looking at one in seven or one in eight people that lives amongst us that cannot afford to feed themselves. It is a very staggering number, which means that it's close to half a million people that lives amongst us. And we did the, the study, five room flats, private property. It's not just rental flats and all that, which all of us you know, have that misconception about. It can be your neighbor, your teammate, you know, uh, your friend, for example, but hunger has no face. So the media is always asking me, you know, how does the hungry in Singapore looks like? Any, you know, color, religion, whatever. Is there a definition? There isn't any definition. Okay. So anybody can go hungry on a regular basis. And a lot of times they are one paycheck from going hungry. So um, I will actually share the link um, to the presentation. I can, I, and then maybe the, the, the Sing Health team can actually share with all the 
people who are attending today. So I won't bore you with that. So this is our mission. We are here to end food insecurity in all forms by 2025. If there was one country that can do it, I genuinely believe that it's going to be Singapore because we are affluent enough. We've got more than enough food to be redistributed because we throw away 30% of everything that we import. And if you ask me what the type of foods that we actually redistribute, um, so the people that we serve currently is really close to 370 organizations uh, in excess of 300,000 people. We are religion agnostic, race agnostic. We are, as long as you're an NGO and you have a regular food program, you can actually be a part of uh, our network. Okay, so please feel free to reach out to us. I will leave my email as well on the chat later on. Um, so firstly, we started out with non-perishables, anything with a date. Um, a frequently asked question is, what does the date on all the package items in Singapore represent? There is no common definition, okay? So because Singapore imports so much, we use the dates that are printed in all the different countries. So if you import something from the US, likely it's a best consumed by date, which means that, okay, you can still eat the biscuit, but maybe it's just not so crunchy. But it's not, it doesn't mean that it's end of life. Okay, but there are some other countries as well that has the date, this expiry date, which means that, okay, if you eat after that date, it's, uh, it's up to your own risk. Okay, it doesn't mean that the quality is bad. It, it means that it, it may be bad already. Um, so non-perishables, that's the first thing that we salvage. So anything that's canned with the date, dry, ambient. And then subsequently, we moved on to perishable items. Anything with cakes with creams, breads with fillings. If you want to know the palette over there, it's from Red Mart. So every day we receive about seven to eight pallets of chilled items. It has chicken, fish, organic salads, yogurts, milks. With three, four days of shelf life, they throw them away every day, about seven to eight pallets of items. Okay, so if we if there wasn't an intervention of these foods, it would have been dumped. And then uh, we also do cook food rescue. We are one of the few um, charities, actually the only charity organization that does rescue of cooked food. So those were the trays from Marina Bay Sands before. So actually Nando's Chicken also um, donate their food as well to us. So they marinate the chicken. And if any of you have worked in a fast food restaurant before like I have, basically it's the best date that they, after they marinate the chicken, you need to fry it or grill it within two days. If not, they will just dump the chicken, okay? But it's perfectly good protein. But it's just to give you an example of the foods that we actually salvage. Um, so we also created Singapore's first and only still good to eat food bank box. Okay, so this is a recycling bin for uh, food donations. So we realized early on about 2013 that a lot of the expats when they were moving house, I had um, the ladies taking buses, you know, with bags and bags of pasta and canned food that say, hey, you know, I am moving house. I'm going back to Norway or something. Where can I put this item? So they actually went all the way down to our warehouse just to put the, put the food donations because they didn't want to throw them away. So we decided to decentralize the food collection. Okay, so this is what we did. So now we have um, more than 70 public locations and actually uh, some of them are in schools as well. Food drives, we used to do a lot, a lot of food drives um, before COVID. So now there's a lot of virtual food drives as well. So people actually, actually um, the students, you know, uh, we, we did some, a few with hospitals as well. Uh, people gathered their food, you know, and then donated it to us. This is something that I wanted to mention about because today is about health and nutrition. And uh, maybe a lot of people feel that um, the social workers, for example, maybe some of you are listening in right now, um, you always feel that for the needy to change that the way they consume is the doctor's work, right? You know, I uh, brainwash them, uh, eat less sugar, uh, eat less carbs, you know, eat more vegetables and blah, blah, blah. But at the food bank, we feel that the way that we can change the way they consume their food is through the donations that we can give. The first people that we need to brainwash is actually the donors. Because actually the donors, they love to donate instant noodles or very unhealthy stuff because they consistently feel that, oh, maybe it's always just plain rice that they eat. You know, they don't donate spreads. They don't donate milks. They don't donate healthier items. In their brains, they just feel that rice, that's it. Or maybe instant noodles. So in order for the underprivileged to eat better, we actually introduced a healthier food bundle where we incorporated hardy vegetables that could last without refrigeration, you know, uh, brown rice, bihun, now with, you know, all the different types of support. Um, the, the pricing of like unpolished rice or mixed rice, you know, or brown rice, bihun, it has significantly gone down. And the thing is that we're trying to tell the underprivileged that eating healthier 
doesn't mean that you need to go on a gluten-free diet or an organic diet or 100% sugar-free diet. It is about adding that two tablespoons of corn to your everyday instant noodles, maybe adding some protein in different ways, you know, uh, and maybe even you can consume it through milks and things like that. Okay, so we also salvage fresh food. Um, you can see all the vegetables laid out. Uh, very sad to tell you that these are the vegetables that every day is dumped at Pasi Panjang. I don't know what's wrong with the Xiao Bai Tai. I don't know what's wrong with the capsicums, but they look perfect to us. And we have actually received more than a thousand cases of organic baby carrots before that was going to be dumped. And we, when we asked the person why, the boss told us, oh, I don't know how to sell. Then I was asking them, why do you import? So, but basically, because the cost of importing in Singapore is very, very cheap. So uh, that's why we threw away 30%. Okay, there's warehouse. We also have a juniors club where we, you can send your kids to torture them from five-year-old onwards. But that's not, we, we, don't, we don't torture them. Lah. But basically, we think that in order to change everybody's mindset about food waste, about nutrition, about food insecurity, we need to start from young because they absorb really fast. So anybody from five years old onwards, you can actually volunteer with us. Uh, you may have seen our vending machines. Uh, we will have 40 over of them rolled out before the end of December. Um, so what happens is we realize a lot of times food aid is not dispensed. We don't have an A and E for food aid distribution. Usually it's during office hours or the social workers only work half day, for example, or the family service centers, the SSO centers only operate half days on a Saturday. But if you are hungry, so let's say if someone ends up in jail, for example, the sole breadwinner, at night, the, maybe the next day immediately, there's no, more, there's no money at home. So basically, they need somewhere where they can get food 24-7. So we decided to do it in a manless way. So we have uh, issued bank cards where we are going to issue out more than 45,000 of these bank cards to the needy population where they can just tap and they have a choice of what they want to redeem. And actually, this year in October, we just rolled out our cooked food machines as well, where together with the National Heart Foundation, we are actually giving people meals, uh, hot meals on demand, healthy and nutritious meals and tasty meals as well. Because a lot of the Meals on Wheels program are not tasty. And actually there's a lot of food waste uh, where we already know every day a few hundred packets are thrown away to feed dogs and feed cats. So um, we wanted to change that. So this is something that we're doing. This feed the city during uh, the circuit breaker. So uh, actually, we are also very happy to say that we supported a lot of hawker centers as well with our feed the city program. So we actually carved out a special program just to help the ho local hawkers, especially those in the CBD area, um, because uh, they basically were suffering a lot. So what we do is we raise funds and we take the money to support the f and outlets. Uh, and then we bought very yummy meals and then we gave it to uh, the people in need. So instead of asking a soup kitchen to cook the meals, we actually gave them restaurant, hawker, great quality food. And I would really like to emphasize here that um, maybe some of you would be shocked with the numbers and you're just looking, wow, you know, it's close to a million meals that you've given out all the way till September. Our humble target was 50,000 meals. But our biggest takeaway for this particular feeding, which I would like to share right now, is that um, food really means a lot to people. And a lot of the underprivileged feel that they are not respected because the food that we give them is, okay, by the way, you got no money, you, you don't have the choice to select what you want to consume. So when we gave the, the old ama, okay, I know that the, a lot of the doctors hearing, they were like, oh my God, you gave her cha kui tiao. Yes, I gave her cha kui tiao. The auntie was so happy. They said, oh my God, I've not eaten cha kui tiao for like a few months already because I can't afford it or I don't know where to buy a good packet. And um, because they eat it so few and far in between, I just wanted to say as well that if any of you are thinking of giving food aid, think of giving them something quality, but you don't have to do it so frequent or so often as well because it really, really warms their heart. And um, due to you know, all the safe distancing measures right now, the only person likely is the social worker or the volunteer that's going out to give them the food. Yeah, and uh, we really, really realized that actually food is filling up the souls as well to make people feel happy, the emotional aspect. Um, so just to end the presentation is that uh, this year, um, so we started out in 2012 with two tons of food. Okay, we redistributed two tons of food just between me and my brother. Um, as of this year, and the months are still counting, we still have another four weeks to go. We are looking at 1.4 million 
kilograms of food that's already distributed this year. So from two tons in 2012, 2020, we're hitting or exceeding uh, 1.4 million tons of food. So if you ask me whether there's people in need that requires food and go hungry on a daily basis, I'll tell you yes. And um, the biggest takeaway from our food insecurity report research is that despite the amount of food and um, networks that we have in Singapore with so many charity organizations, 80% um, of the people interviewed said that they don't know where to get food help. And I think this is a very big problem for, for, for Singapore in general, especially I've mentioned this to MSF and the ministers as well. Um, there is no communicated way of where food aid is being given. Everyone is just blindly giving. So a lot of the social workers have also written to us, and I think some of them from Sing Health, in fact, they said that, you know, I've got this uncle that stays in this block, but I don't know where to direct him to get help, to, to get food aid. So next year, 2021, a big program that we're doing, um, I will end my sharing here. Um, but I will actually tell you that, um, you know, how do I stop my sharing? Uh, yes, okay. Um, I would like to say that uh, we are putting together Singapore's first feeding directory, not on the hawkers' foods, okay? That one you can uh, go to Dr. Day's <laughs> website. But we are actually putting together a national directory of where all the food aid can be gotten and we'll be sharing with all the, the doctors, nutritionists, uh, social workers as well. So we will be in touch really, really shortly, uh, first quarter of next year. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nicole, for that uh, sobering lecture in some ways. We can never be grateful enough for how lucky we are. And thank you for the amazing work that Food Bank is doing. There's already uh, one of the participants who wants to contribute. So we, we'll, we'll try and link you up uh, after. Also, thank you for sharing about the food disorder, uh, eating disorders. Uh, that was very brave of you to, to share what must have been a really tough experience. And you know, you are living embodiment of what is possible, you know, how far you can come. Um, this is supposed to be the Q&A session uh, and, you know, uh, to, for, for the participants to, uh, you know, submit your questions and I will redirect it towards the, uh, the, the panelists. Um, maybe I will start with a question of my own. Um, you know, food is part of our identity, right? It, it sort of defines who, who are the in-group, who's included in our meals, who are excluded from our meals. There is high status, low status food, and and, 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 and so on. Um, I, I was wondering, you know, um, uh, what what do y'all think about how 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 entwined is food in Singapore in Singaporeans' identity? And you know, um, um, could could you say a little bit about that? Perhaps Leslie. Things uh, are, you know, if you look at any culture. And uh, if you want to put, uh, you know, if you if we con con compare ourselves with uh, typical American or, or European, and uh, you know, if you if you look at the French, you know that the French put food on very high up uh, in uh, in their priority, whereas the American, you know, the, the way they eat, it, it perhaps it's not as as high up. For Singaporeans, it's very up, it's very much up there. Uh, I, and I've always thought that uh, it's because, uh, you know, in our small little red dot here, uh, there's not many other things that you really can get so involved in. Uh. I mean, we don't have the net, the great outdoors. Uh, we, we do have some, but we don't have a lot of great outdoors. So so uh, what we have here in, in abundance uh, are shopping centers and uh, hawker centers. So so our, you know, our biggest part, uh, pastime would be uh, eating and, uh, and uh, shopping. So, so yeah, when, when you talk to a Singaporean, they'll invariably talk about food because food is such a big part of our lives. When, whenever we gather, it's always, uh, food is always involved. And when you talk to a typical Singaporean, I think we are the, uh, the nation with the most diverse uh, kind of palate. You know? uh, when you talk to uh, you know, a typical person in the US, they probably haven't been exposed to uh, you know, Korean, Japanese, uh, even even uh, you know, Indian, uh, Chinese, or whatever. But when you talk to a typical Singaporean, he's probably has eaten. You know, I'm not talking to the, the 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 people who are benefiting from the food bank, of course. But you know, the the middle class Singaporean have eaten a, a wide array a, a range of food, and because we are we are a small country, we travel all the time, and whenever these people travel, they want to bring back something from their travel, something that impressed them. And so this country, even when it comes to 
when it comes to cheese, I mean, I'm doing a, a cheese project at the moment. And it's just amazing that we have so many different kinds of cheeses in those small little red dot. We've got hundreds of different kinds of cheese from France, from France, from Italy, from Greece. I mean, it's just incredible. And I, we even have a little cheese shop that goes and uh, goes and procures cheese from little farms, you know, that, that, that you're unheard of. Little farmers, they just they just have that, that cheese, and we have it in Singapore. <laughs> so so you can see, you can see, it's very much in our blood, you know, that we eat. All right, thanks. I I, I guess we can get the details of all those things you're talking about from your blog. Um, Nicole, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think it's um, I mean for 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 the position that we're in, I mean the government has also made it very easy for us to import open businesses, all food related. You know, there's no taxation on food items and all that. So that's why we you you, you notice there's a lot of trends, there's a lot of different um uh, flavors and all that as well. And definitely because we are so well connected to everywhere else in the world, where we are cosmopolitan in itself. And even my own clientele, so to say, for the food services side of things, I mean, out of my 5,000 over establishments, I've got anybody from your Shake Shack to your Bar Chow store, and anybody in between, between your Odets, you know, and your Bread Tops as well. So it's very, very diverse, and most of them are all doing still very well. So I, I, I think uh, food is in um, our lifeline. But I also like to take this opportunity for all of you to, to realize that actually Singapore is ahead of the game when it comes to food. Whether is it food tech or food innovation, we may not have enough farms, but um, did, did you know that we are attracting a lot of high-tech farms into Singapore? And uh, a lot of the international farms have actually made Singapore their home. So for all you know, we may be uh, the farm go-to place for the future. And it's not just about landed farms as well, but it, it, it will be seasonal agnostic, you know, winter vegetable, you know, during springtime and vice versa and things like that. And with that, it ties into your nutritional content as well, because indoor grown vegetables can indeed be denser and nutrition, cleaner as well. So there's a lot of positive sides, you know, while we are struggling through this pandemic, to think about how we are going to pivot um, uh, in, terms, in terms of our food source as well. Yeah. So, so soon we'll be producers as well as consumers of food. Uh, yeah, that's great. I, I was going to just build on that to ask about, you know, uh, food being the social glue for families. And what, what are your thoughts on, you know, the family meal, you know, in, in Singapore? Um, you know, and, and, and how, how would that fit into what, what, we've, what we've just spoken about? Any thoughts? Yeah, definitely. When I was uh, growing up, uh, the family meal was a very uh, a bigger part of our lives. I think uh, you know, growing up in the seventies, uh, it was mom. Mom wasn't uh, mom wasn't working, so she she's the one who prepared the family meal. Dad would come home from work, and then all the all the kids would have to come to the table, and we all have to sit sit and eat a meal together, and uh, that really brought the family together. And I think. Today, uh, today Singapore is quite different. A lot of people eat out, you know, even with families, you know, everybody will just eat their own thing, come back. It's no longer such a big, major part. But although, although it is still very much in our blood, uh, you know, family meals are usually, eat, you know, for those families who don't cook, they are usually eaten in a restaurant and they take the the opportunity to catch up with each other. But yeah, the uh, the the healthy kind of uh, family meal, which is like you know vegetables, fish with a bowl of rice uh, over a family table, mom cook. Uh, that 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 really is um, is not as as commonplace as it was as it was in the past. Okay, and and Nicole, I was going to ask you. You know, when we think about food insecurity, um, there's an element about providing for the family when it comes to food as well, right? And, and, you know, I was just wondering, you know, what, what, what your experiences on that has been, you know, that, that, that psychological impact of not being able to provide for the family, uh, you know, when, when families have uh, confronted with food insecurity. Yeah, um, being a mom to four young kids, you know, my eldest is eight, my youngest is one years old. Um, the thing about during the circuit breaker when, when we were one of the few white labeled charities that go, could go door to door, um, we have encountered so many families where the children actually ran up to our volunteers, started tugging on their pants and say that, uncle, my mommy three days never eat already. And they were just waiting for that packet of food to come in. I mean, it's not a, it's not a scene that you imagine yourself 
seen in Singapore. And the, um, and the ironical part is that they stay in a four-room flat with three plasma TVs. So what has gotten us to this level where even someone who can stay in a regular HDB mid-income but cannot afford to feed themselves despite food in Singapore being so affordable. I think it is important to note, like in most Asian countries, we're not alone on this. There is that sense of stigma in terms of stepping up to get food aid. It may not be as shameful, for example, to say that I cannot pay my medical bills or I cannot pay my school fees, for example, because the, the bills are exorbitant, right? But if you say that you cannot even afford to spend $100 on groceries for that month, it's very telling. And so this has actually stopped um, some people as well from coming up to say that they actually need help. So um, that's another part of uh, the work that we need to do next year. Yeah, when we are addressing the gaps in the system. But you're right to say that um, there is a stigma attached. Right. Um, well, I'm, I'm looking through the questions. A lot of the questions are directed to one or the other of the panelists. And what I was going to tell uh, the audience is that I'll, we will get the panelists to uh, type out answers to these questions, uh, you know, which are specific. And I know that uh, Nicole is going to get a lot of volunteers at least for, for food bankers. A lot of people, uh, you know, I think on top of the fact that we're all interested in all the food that Leslie talked about, I think it, it, the, the Nicole's talk has woken everyone up to, you know, some of the real problems. Okay, you can eat where the recommended hawkers are and then you come and volunteer to burn the calories. Why not? Yeah, That way we can be healthy as well. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll end off with another general question. You know, uh, something that's very typical about Singapore, I mean, about food and culture in general, but in typical about Singapore food as well, the whole idea about taboo foods, comfort foods, you know, we have this cooling food, you know, heaty food and all that. Um, Leslie, I don't know, what, what, what's your take on all that? I mean, uh, is, is this something that's uniquely Singaporean or is this, uh, is this pervasive in other cultures and we're just unaware of it? Um, you know, and, and how does that affect, uh, you know, uh, affect our, our food identity? Uh, yeah, well, I think cooling and heatiness uh, is, is very much a Chinese uh, TCM kind of concept. Yeah, we, we, we do hear of it. Um, I suppose the question again, how does it affect? No, I was just, I was, I was just going to ask, you know, uh, is, is this something that is pervasive in different food cultures or is this something that is very uniquely Singaporean, uh, you know, in, in, the way that, uh, in, in the way we classify food in this way? Um, no, I mean, uh, if we go to China, they'll talk about such things because that's, that's, the, that's the cultural belief. I mean, you go to India, I think the Indians also have their own uh, medicine and their way of thinking about uh, food. Uh, of course, a lot of it is is un it's it's very difficult because there's no standard script for the for what is heaty and what is cool, what you can eat during pregnancy, what you can't. <laughs> so it depends on your grandmother uh, or your mum or whoever whoever tells you to do such thing. Uh, my my advice to uh, all these young people is, is just listen to mum because if anything happened to you and then after that baby come out are really not as fair as uh, they like you know you didn't eat your bird's nest you know and, and it becomes your fault but if the baby still comes out not as fair and you ate your bird's nest then it's not your fault anymore <laughs> you've done what you've done so <laughs> no no it's very much part of our culture lah. I mean yeah yeah, and I mean one of the, I mean you're absolutely right. And one of the things I'm always amazed by is that all of us find it impossible to precisely define what is heaty and cooling. Yet all of us seem to know intuitively what is heaty and cooling. And I know that's always like, too much puree gets sore through, not sure. Exactly. The one, the one we know. Yeah. So I also can't explain it to you medically, right? So so I just ah yeah heaty. <laughs> Just listen to your grandmother. Yeah, that's a good advice. Nicole, what about taboo foods and health and, and you no know, comfort foods? And any thoughts on 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 you know those topics? Yeah, I, I feel that um, there's always your go-to favorite kwe kwe or your whatever, right? Uh, and and but I think it's more in tune to how we were brought up, perhaps. Like when you were young, you were given that, that particular food, for example. So it ties in a lot with, with the emotional well-being and the emotional part of things as well. Um, I, I, I bring my kids into the kitchen from a very young age, two plus, and my mom still keeps all those old Nonya Pengkang stuff, you know, and then we will make all this kueh balu on the, on the charcoal. And I just feel that despite the, the kueh balu and all that doesn't turn out nice, right? Yeah, but it's, it's that whole connection to the culture part as well. And if 
simply drinking an extra bottle of rhino water <laughs> makes the older folks happy and it keeps some culture alive. Why not? I mean, that maybe the bottle of water doesn't do much harm to my body, but you know, like my, my mom just told my kids today, hey, you're a bit heaty, drink chrysanthemum tea <laughs> this morning. <laughs> it's like, but I think it's very much just entrenched in the culture and sometimes respecting certain things, it is, it's not detrimental to our health. I said, why not? Okay, all right. Well, I'm sure we can we can go on and on and on talking about food, um, but I'm going to let let our panelists off the hook. Um, I would like to thank both of them, Dr. Leslie Tay and Ms. Nicholson, for uh, an absolutely superb session today. Um, we've, they've managed the impossible task of being intellectual without being condescending, uh, of being informative without being tedious, and uh, you know, and you know, they've left me absolutely hungry. Uh, not only for food, but also for more conversations about food and about food insecurity. I mean, uh, you know, uh, as I said, there are lots of questions uh, on, on the on the Q and A about this. Um, just like to to finish off by by letting everyone know um, this webinar series on medical humanities is made possible by the untiring team of Gary Suhaila and Kashni from the medical humanities office. Uh, at SingHealth, Duke NUS uh, Medicine Academic Clinical Program. Uh, the series was conceived by Dr. Warren Fong and Dr. Ong Eng Kun uh, with the support of Prof. Lu Chen Min, who's the chair of our program. Um, and also just to remind everyone, uh, medical humanities is an interdisciplinary field that helps to expand the scope of medical practice beyond narrow biomedical models. And today's uh, webinar is a perfect example of this, right? Um, this helps us understand the biographies of the people whose health is our responsibility, right? Um, you know, there's, there's a writer, Susie Much, who says that, you know, we're trying to shift the practice of medicine from something that we do to patients or do for patients to a partnership that empowers people to live better lives. We're, letting, we're, we're trying to help people write their own health story and uh, write their own, um, uh, correct their own illnesses. So look out for the next in our series, um, uh, this webinar series where we'll explore the role uh, of faith and prayer uh, in the face of sickness. All right. So thanks once again to Dr. Leslie Tay, to, uh, to Ms. Nicole Ng for helping us on this journey. Uh, good day to all of you and have a great weekend ahead. I promise you we will, uh, we will type out all the questions and, uh, and, uh, and get answers from our uh, esteemed panelists and we will send it to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.